We're live. Well, welcome everyone. Bienvenidos, bonjour, and glad to have all of you here for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry to brighten your day, evening, for us to all revel together at the end of the first week of Women's History Month in the US and on International Women's Day Eve. Um, a particular welcome to those of you who have been attending the Associated Writing Program's annual conference this week. Um, I'm your host, Sandy Yanone, author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry. And again, I thank you so much for joining me today from a sunny anticipating spring day here in Old Saybrook, Connecticut. And a warm welcome to all of you joining us live in our Zoom poetry studio and those watching live from Facebook. And of course, many of you will be watching us as a recording and we're so glad that you do. Well, today it is my absolute pleasure to um, be able to introduce our five featured poets whose diverse journeys and perspectives truly will encourage us to think across generations um, and histories of women's experiences and lives. Before I introduce today's poets, a little bit about Cultivating Voices live poetry. We began at the end of March, 2020. And yes, that means we're getting ready for our one year anniversary. Um, this was in response to the shutdowns of in-person venues everywhere. And we've developed into an international, intergenerational, intersectional reading series and poetry community with now over 2,400 members worldwide. We alternate weekly readings between a themed reading with a live open mic, like today's reading, and our increasingly popular new books showcase with an occasional special event reading sprinkled in just for good measure. Recordings of today's program will appear on our Facebook and YouTube channels shortly after we complete the live reading. And I wanna thank Don Krieger as always for providing the invaluable tech and archival support. Well, and now to today's featured poets with just so much gratitude for uh, your eagerness to step up when I contacted you to ask, would you read today to help celebrate Women's History Month? I'll introduce each poet before they read and then return at the beginning of our second hour for our live open mic. Well, first reading today is Archana Sani, who, um, as I was saying earlier in before we started, that um, I have never forgotten her first reading because she began when she came on to the screen talking immediately about the divine feminine. And um, for months, I've had her name penciled in for this day in anticipation that I'd be able to manifest this reading and then manifest that she could be with us. I'm so grateful that, in fact, both things came true. And here is a little more about Archana Sani. Archana Sani is a Toronto poet who currently lives between Canada and India. She is the author of First Fire, Calcutta, India from Yeti 2005, and another Nirvana, Toronto, Mawenzi in 2018. She is also a full member of the League of Canadian Poets. She currently is working on a collection of her mystical poetry and another manuscript which explores her relationship with Aboriginal Canada. Much of her new work is informed by her recent Kundalini spiritual awakening. As a life coach, Archana supports personal 
reinvention of the self through spiritual development and awakening. As I mentioned before, her most recent collection is another Nirvana, and it can be purchased on the website that we'll have for you in the chat. And please visit her at um, her own website. Would you please welcome our first featured reader for today's wonderful celebration, Arshna Sani. Oh, you need to unmute. <laughs> okay, so you got me there. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna start again. Thank you so much, Sandy and Don. I feel so honored and excited and grateful, you know, for this opportunity and especially to be reading on this very special day, um, you know, Women's History Month as well as International Women's Day. It feels really great to be, um, you know, to be, it feels like home, like I'm back home. <laughs> and, um, you know, special thanks to Sandy, whom I have really grown fond of, I, I, and, and whom I have grown to admire as a person and as a poet. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity, doubly grateful for this opportunity. Um, and I was just thinking, what is sisterhood without a tribute to a sister. <laughs> um, you know, so uh, I'd like to begin with the first poem, which is, which is a tribute to Sandy Yanon. And then I have four other poems, um, which I hope to read. You know, Sandy will tell me if I'm overstepping the times, but I'd like to begin with uh, tribute to Sandy Yanon. Tribute to Sandy Yanon. If our poems were homes and see we live a city, you would live in a castle atop a hill, not because being host you thought you deserved it, but so that you could see us all better. Some of us need awakening and some need marijuana to expand our boundaries. Needing neither, you bring an ever expanding heart carrying countries while next to your smiling face, your hosting hands hold high a namaste, a heart, a teddy bear with equal ease. The mysterious portal CV Live I dived into became the magical waterfall of my childhood film, Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, behind which I found the spirit that soars beyond poetry wings all the places I wanted to visit, a finer view of Turtle Island and my beloved city atop your hill. Calling you my friend, beloved friend, is to declare the virtual real. Zoom country makes me your neighbor. I knocked at your door empty handed. I leave making your treasures my gifts sprouting beyond time and space. In one hand, I hold leaves of grass transfigured. In the other, manifesta's grace. This is in particular, you know, tribute to Sandy's poem Manifesta, which I really admire. So just to, um, just wanted to let you know for the ones who've not uh, read the poem Man Manifesta, please do read it. Um, I think on purpose, I did not uh, include poems having to do with the divine feminine directly, because I thought, what is divinity if it's not channeled through real women, women, you know, flesh and blood women? It, it has no meaning in, in life. <laughs> so, um, so the next poem is, you know, is a tribute to Emily Bronte, whom I really admire. So here it is, tribute to Emily Bronte. Contemplating you is a kind of cleansing and I can do it at will. 
I find you in a country called Heath between God and Gondal, where you are not a woman, but everything that arrives suddenly, wild grass, weeds, and a surge of passing wind. Somewhere between the slabs of the earth on which you wrote and the pages of your book, you move in and out as if through a door. Those who have never gone beyond your mapped contraries have stopped to peep at the keyhole and watched in disbelief to see you shed your skin and walk out as Heathcliff. Stronger than a man, simpler than a child, said Charlotte about you, but you were more. Woman Magus, mystic of mystics, you died into a new life trying to sap the juice of brooks and thunderbolts into your body, your book. Only one like you so drunk on life could dream up the kind of love that turns dictionaries to dust. Um, my, my next poem is um, called I Mother of Moksha Rain Tree. It's a recent poem and it kind of um, challenges this idea of being a step parent or step motherhood because I personally don't believe that a step parent can really be a parent, especially if there's a child, who, you know, which is a grown up child. So this whole concept of blended family and um, you know, step family, I think it's a kind of, it's a misnomer. So I think it's a new family constellation which really comes into being, which is more realistic. So I'm just kind of, um, this is what this poem is about. And I'm writing kind of manifesto based on this, which I get to complete. So here it is. Um, I, mother of moksha rain tree. Moksha in Sanskrit means liberation, like nirvana. And Rain Tree is the last name of, you know, it, it's a First Nation's last name. There should be a category of another kind of excluded who wait, standing outside what we call a home, looking in through a window, like Frankenstein in Mary Shelley's novel, learning the ABC of not belonging. The other mother, don't call me a stepmother. I'm not a step anything, and I'm definitely not a mother. In another poem, I will tell you why I am, and yet I am not the other. For now, let me just say, I'm just a woman married to a man with a grown up child that does not make me a mother. Adhering to a concept, not having the experience, makes me the other, yes, the other, which I refuse to be. I could have had a child, but don't you see, another child would take away from the first love, money, and property. Those who have reproduced, adopted, had the money to commission a child through surrogacy, don't tell me to sponsor a child of world vision or love my nephews or nieces or serve in an orphanage. I'm not Mother Teresa, are you? Don't tell me, oh, you're so lucky. You can travel whenever you want. You've never had to wake up to change soiled nappies or sacrifice your career. Do you know if Mephistopheles existed? I would sell my soul to him to have what many of you take for granted. Only those who never wanted a child can be called child free. For now, I am childless. And yet looking everywhere, looking for my daughter, Moksha Raintree, you were supposed to be real by now. You were supposed to have been reciting poems in Ojibwe and Sanskrit, have combined the Vedic fire and the Anishinaabe moon ceremony. I'm waiting for you, Moksha Raintree, on the thought bridge of the 24th century, which only those 
who have paid their dues to compassion, love, and justice can cross, where borders of countries dissolve, leaving only poets, seers, nonviolent revolutionaries, and outward looking mystics. And I, mother of Moksha Rain Tree. So that is, um, is my poem. And I'm trying to manifest her. <laughs> okay. The, the next poem is, um, the next poem is called Draupadi. She's a character, she's a heroine of ancient Indian epic Mahabharata. It's supposed to be the longest epic uh, in the world. She's married to five men who are brothers and she's, uh, she's viewed as a feminist symbol because she challenges the idea that a woman can be the property of a man. But somehow, you know, I wrote my PhD dissertation on her. Somehow I kind of find she's not radical enough and that she should have, you know, she should have um, spoken her mind, but she doesn't, I, you know. So, so I feel that she has kind of, because she didn't speak her mind, we missed the opportunity and that she made women miss the opportunity. This is my, this is how I view Draupadi. This is the poem, Draupadi. Draupadi. I do not find your silence enigmatic. It is not the kind of silence that speaks. You arrived too late on the scene with fire in your veins, seeking revenge for wrongs that are still committed. Nirbhaya too was you. What are you gonna do about it? You who couldn't say no to man, sage, mother-in-law and God when they yoked you to five men while your heart was only with one. What are you, goddess, victim, crusader for justice, or simply a ruse for a war that others wanted? What did all your bravery amount to? Even your tirade rings empty. It comes too late. I do not find your silence enigmatic. It is not the kind of silence that speaks. In your silence, I feel only the betrayal of a lost revolution, a lost epic. Draupadi, why did you let them maim your tongue and put centuries to sleep? Sunny, do I have time or am I done? I do? I think, yeah, I think we could go on, yeah. Okay, so in that case, I'll read uh, the last poem and that is a tribute to my mother. I can say it's about real women. <laughs> it's called Mother in You, There is a Poem. Mother, is it not strange that I have begun to long for your childhood, not mine? In you, there is a poem I'm trying to write. I climbed on garden trees, but you ran through forests, chasing wild hair and drinking goat's milk, bringing tadpoles and fireflies home in a jar. Now that the trees have given way to concrete, how do I inhabit your five-year-old body fleeing like an arrow through the wind? No doubt your memories could help me piece together a time when I was not. But now I want to enter a time beyond memory when my unborn eyes first opened to see the pale pink of your womb, deeper still to the time when you lay against your mother's womb dreaming of me. Mother, this is the dream I will retrieve. This is the poem I will write entering that dark womb of space, the source of all epics struggling to be born. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you. Oh, I mean, I, I, 
And I said that Sha was getting so choked up through so much of the reading. Um, that yeah, thank you so much. I'm I'm so grateful that Cultivating Voice has brought all of us together, and um, and what a way to begin our celebration of women and history and the, the generations. Um, I think of seven generations before, seven generations forward. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Namaste. I'm going to move along to our next reader who um, is my dear friend that I known for quite a while, Jan Freeman. And what I want to say before I share her of Jan's bio is that if you have never read Muriel Rue Kaiser's The Life of Poetry, first of all, order it and read it. And second, then thank Jan Freeman, because Jan Freeman is the reason that the life of poetry came back into print. She started her press, Paris Press, for that sole purpose when she originally did that. And it extended far greater. Um, she's done extraordinary work for years uh, in the service of um, women's voices. And now let me please share with you the little more formal biography. Jan Freeman is the author of three collections of poetry, most recently Blue Structure from Calypso Editions and the co-editor of Sisters, an anthology. She was the founder and longtime director of Feminist Paris Press and now teaches workshops and runs the Mass MOCA, that's a Museum of Contemporary Art, Writing Through Art Poetry Retreats. Mass MOCA Writing Through Art Poetry Retreats. Poems from her manuscript in progress, Mobius, are forthcoming in Plume, The North American Review, and Nine Mile. And I'm so glad to welcome Jan Freeman. Thanks for returning your last time with us was at Votes for Women. Uh, it's great to have you back. Thank you so much, uh, Sandy. I feel really honored to be here celebrating International Women's Day. I am so grateful to you and to Elizabeth Ann and Don Krieger for this extraordinary reading series. Uh, a huge pandemic accomplishment and a gift to all of us. Um, everything that I do, everything that I am is informed by the women's movement and by the great women of change, tenacity and bravery who preceded the women's movement and who continue to make it possible to speak the truth of women's experience, the truth of human experience from Sappho to Elizabeth Cady Stanton to Emma Lazarus to Gwendolyn Brooks, who was the first poet I read as a child, I heard read as a child, and then who I read as a child, thanks to my mother, uh, who took me to a library in Philadelphia where, where she was reading. I am so grateful to Audrey Lord and to my poetry mothers, Muriel Rukeyser, and Ruth Stone. The first poem that I'd like to read is in conversation with one of my favorite poems by Ruth Stone. Ruth's poem is Hanging Laundry. And my poem is Hanging the Dirty Laundry. Father's ties were mother's noose. Round he wrapped the cotton silk. Under, through, he pulled them tight. Over the bag, over her head, mother drugged with sedatives, boom, dead. 
He changed his mind when mother smiled. He called the cops, come, suicide. She nearly died, father cried. Our hero, all the children cried. My hero, frightened mother lied. Bad mother, all the children cried and turned their backs on suicide. Selfish greed, the children said, yes, we wish mother were dead. And each child loved their father more or loved her less. Marriage was a suicide that mother finally survived when father died. And I'd like to read a very new poem, uh, baby in parentheses, anthem. Squeeze the baby, make her cry, pop your big toe in her eye, baby drool and baby poop, clean the baby, sweep the roof, put the baby in a pot, wipe her nose and boil the rot. If baby lives to be a girl, thread the baby like a pearl, press the girl into a dress, punish girl for baby's mess. Watch the girl bloom as girls should, hammer girl like walnut wood. Make a box or make a shelf, level big girl on the well. Pump the water bright and clear, tease her hair, braid her fear. When her feet push through the sides, tell her all the big girl lies. Fill a house and build a fence. Pitch a baby in her tent. Soon a mama will awake with a smelly, easy bake. Set the table, paint a crib, stitch a name on baby's bib. This is how all families grow. Like the wheat, plant seeds in rows. Scrub the tears, smash the peas, smear the door, tie the keys. Mama's born and mama's made. Pledge allegiance, replicate. Um, this next poem uh, is called Redaction and I'm honored to have it included in a wonderful new anthology that was just released last week called Welcome to the Resistance, Poetry as Protest, which is edited by Ona Gritz and Taylor Sabbath. I recommend it to everyone. Redaction. I don't like you, but I can't draw a line through you. You can draw a line through me. You say, I don't like those words you said. You say, I don't think you know what you said when you said it. So I'll cross out the words for you with a wide, dark mark. You are selective when you cross me out. I choose this line. I don't choose that line. You know what you like. You know what no one should like. So you get rid of the words, you get rid of us. If pages look like punched in teeth, we pretend they are maps of cemeteries. Whether or not I did or did not, do what you say I did, you create your story and mine and make it as confusing and simple as you want it to be. I think of you when night arrives, the sky is your redaction. If you hide me from my story, if no one can find anything but your hands inside my story, it does not matter. Everyone believes you even when they don't believe you. It's so much easier to believe you than believe, I know this, I know that. If you cross out what you don't like, as if I were a book or your own thoughts, you are my father reading the book and writing it. We all can do that if we know what we know without questions. I will redact too but invisibly, because you are the ink and you are the paper and you are the long black lines in the redaction of history. And the last poem that I'll read is in three sections. It's called The Odyssey of Yes and No. 
one. No, I cannot say no, I say yes. No cannot be said until the father is dead. Even when the father is dead, no, I will say yes, not no. No is not said in front of the mother, even when the father is dead. The mother mirrors his square head. Even when the father is dead, the mother does not stop saying yes to the father. But when I ask the mother about her suicide, she says, no, not yes, no. No, she says, he made it up. No, she says, no. Then I cry like tiny tears who arrived in a box from the box tops of sugar pops. I hold the mother's hand and we sit without yes or no. Even if she closes her eyes and dies, she said no, there was no suicide. If she can say yes while saying no, she says yes, but she said no, which sets the story straight. Two, no, the father says no, the father says no, do not say no. The daughter says yes, yes, she says yes to the father. Yes, 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 she says over and over. Only yes, the father said, do not say no. The mother says no, yes, no, yes, 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 no, yes, yes. The daughter says yes, yes, no, until she needs to say no. But she says, yes, no, and falls down. When she gets up, she tries to say no. She tries to say no, but no is too hard to say. So she says, no, yes, yes, no, yes, yes, no, no, yes, no. She says, yes, yes, no, yes, no, until she says, no, yes. Then she says, no. A truck drives towards the daughter, and she shouts, Yes, yes, no, no, no. The truck is very close. And she says, yes, no, no, no. The road is late at night and the daughter's no becomes the sparrow. The sparrow flies above the truck and it doesn't save the daughter. The truck may have heard yes, yes, no, and yes, no, 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 or only yes. The truck may have listened or didn't listen, there is no way to know. But we know the daughter said no after yes, and the father said no, and the mother said no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and the daughter died. Three, this is the key that turns the lock. The lock is like a clock. It rings like the clock in the tower when all the petals from the chestnut trees on Rue de la Porte lift over the picnic tables and cover the lawn and the cars in the parking lot. The key is stuck in the old lock that belongs to the broken chapel. Nothing turns quietly. The mother and father cannot look back. They are dead. The daughter can spin like the petals of chestnut trees in a resurrection if the truck hears the daughter, no, 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 or if there is no truck when the daughter says no. If the daughter says no and the father says no, you may not say no. And the mother says no, there was no suicide. She says his yes was no. No was never, no was yes. Then the daughter, over time, can rise. Thank you. Wow, Jan, that, that meditation on the vast space and the infinitesimal space between no and yes. And, um, and what those words mean when I think about my own life and the lives of my friends and women I don't know, but that I want to say yes to. 
I wanted to also ask you to please put the link to, um, if you would put the information about where redaction will appear in the chat for everybody, because that anthology sounds like a must on all of our shelves. I am happy to. Thank you Thank so much. You. Um, you know, I love you and I have so much respect for you and I've learned so much from you. Um, thank you. Our next reader, what is amazing for me about Cultivating Voices is that I have the pleasure to have a, a poet like Jan Freeman join a person I've known for a long time whose work has certainly helped me carry my own on my own journey and also meet poets like our next poet Silvia Ramos Cruz whom I did not know before the pandemic but who's from every time we interact same is true of you Archana every time we interact um you know, my, my life is richer and my understanding of the human experience and what history has done um, to erase women's lives and also call out for women's lives is, is um, it becomes a clarion call every time I um, have the pleasure to interact um, and listen to the work of Sylvia Ramos. Cruz. A little more about Sylvia from the more formal bio. Uh, Sylvia Ramos Cruz is inspired to write by art, women's lives, and everyday injustices. Her award winning prose poetry and photographs appear in local and national print and online publications. Ongoing projects focus on New Mexico women's history. And she is a retired surgeon and women's rights activist, still working, working on the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment, otherwise known to us as the ERA. Would you please welcome Sylvia Ramos Cruz. Thank you very much, Sandy, for that lovely and generous introduction. Uh, it, uh, it is what you are, a lovely and generous person and a, and a real supporter of all of us poets out here. Thank you for including me in this august group of readers. I am actually quite overwhelmed by that, uh, but I will do my best. And thank you for all of you uh, coming here today to celebrate women's history. I will be reading four poems. Three are from a little ways back, uh, all relate to my story, which of course is a woman's story. I give a history before each of the poems. The first one is a memory from my childhood about women I saw working in my grandfather's farm in Puerto Rico, which is where I was born. Colonization of the island in 1898 brought capitalism and also the opportunity for poor women to enter the labor market. Many became tobacco factory workers, removing the stems and veins from leaves before they were processed. Most, if not all, join labor unions as a way to improve their lives and the well-being of their families. In fact, they were very active in the unions and in 1908, asked their union leaders to present a petition before the island's legislature requesting the vote for Puerto Ricanas. In the United States mainland, as you know, women won the vote in 1920. It took until 1929 for educated women in Puerto Rico to get the vote. The rest of the women waited until 1935. I just learned this history recently. 
knew nothing about it when I wrote this poem that I will read to you today. Now I wonder if some of those women I saw in the barn in my grandfather's farm had been part of the struggle to get women rights to vote in Puerto Rico. Of course, I'll never know, but I see them in a different light today. Barredor. Wilted tobacco leaves hung from rafters like spent dirty handkerchiefs. Below them, village women sat on the ground, stripped central veins, plated resinous half blades into thick braids. They coiled into rolls and that left fingers, pardon me, they coiled into rolls that left deft fingers sticky and stained. And Papa Juan, tied to the flanks of his horse, rode to town, sold to auctioneers on the plaza across from the church and city hall. Las Mujeres kept careful track of which pile they used so as not to mingle leaves segregated by quality into three. I never remember the names of the other two, just the barredor, broad leaves that sat at the bottom of the stem where they brushed earth swish swishing in warm Caribbean winds, crawled and munched on by a host of insects dying of DDT, trampled by children running like escaped prisoners to climb mango trees after school. Barredor, floor sweeper, never expecting to be more than just good enough to go into cigarettes or chewing tobacco no expectation of becoming a Havana, good enough to be clenched between the teeth of Fidel Castro as he glared across the Florida Straits at JFK. The women's withered faces, tar splintered teeth, tobacco tanned hands made them look decades older. They chattered constantly as they weaved, laughing at stories they'd heard a million times, spitting thick tobacco juice into corners of the barn, cotton skirts sweeping dirt floor as they leaned in, plunged fingers into aromatic pyramids they spun into brown gold. When I was growing up, girls were expected to be housewives and mothers. Had my family stayed in Puerto Rico, that is what I might have done, put my trust in marriage as my role in life, hoping to be fulfilled and happy. That is what my mother did and what women around her did. However, we moved to New York where I saw other possibilities, found other opportunities. I went to medical school instead. Chopped liver. The pungent, slightly metallic smell of Mrs. Weinberg's chopped liver wafted in the air belched by factory smokestacks just a few blocks away from the anatomy lab where Roger Ratz, Raymond Reich, and I gingerly picked apart the greater gluteus fibers of Mr. Green's formalin pickled sacred bone. It brought memories of mom's cumin speckled chicken livers in brown sauce that my sisters and I would eat over rice, building our stores of iron against the day when the heavy red metal would flow from our bodies in a ritual of monthly purification designed to turn us into childbearing, dutiful wives. I remember my mother's story. In the early days of their marriage, my father loved her liver and she loved cooking it for him. He would arrive famished after a long day lugging Underwood typewriters, riding city buses from one business to another, hoping for a sale. The rust colored fleshy delicacies were guaranteed to sap his spirit, if not his feet. When he started college classes, he took a night job in the morgue at the hospital where my three sisters and I were born. One day he came home, pea faced and peaked, told my mother not to serve him liver ever. He had seen them in the raw, dislocated, discolored, cancerous, and cracked, would never see them 
in any other light. Decades later, my mother still relished telling this tale every time she ate her liver, savoring every morsel, long after my father left her and four little girls just as suddenly as he stopped loving her liver. When I became a surgeon, women were half a percent of surgeons in the United States and Puerto Rican women surgeons like hen's teeth. Most of the time in my training, I was the only woman on my team. By the time I finished and joined a medical school faculty, there were a handful of women residents in the program. Occasionally, when most of us were off duty, I'd have them over for dinner. For this, I was criticized by my chairman because I was not asking the male relatives to, the, pardon me, the male residents to join us. I countered that the men were fre frequently invited to golf and tennis outings with the male faculty. I countered that the men residents were frequently invited to golf and tennis outings with the male faculty while they changed clothes in the doctor's locker room. There was no locker room for women doctors. We changed with the nurses. A place of our own. We gather in my living room in Riverdale above the dark still waters of the Hudson for dinner in a space devoid of men, a space where we can sit, relax, free of male clothing and attitudes donned each time we go into the OR, ER, ICU, a space where we can let our guard down, rearm for the battles of another day, spread around the spacious room, eating takeout food, my culinary talents undeveloped, more lack of interest than lack of time. The few who inhabit this man's cutting world are as different from one another as we are from them. We are the toughest nails woman, the one who cries the fattest tears ever seen woman, the flaky woman, the much too soft woman, the maybe too old woman, the pretty plump woman, and I, the one who's been through the whole process and still stands, woman. So I've heard us called. Occasionally, my nine-year-old daughter wanders in, drawn by the jokes and laughter, clinical anecdotes, sobering stories, and yes, ranting and ravings of women who chose to take the knife against all odds. To her, we're all just fine women. I have spent the last several years working with many others to get the Equal Rights Amendment into the Constitution. I'll end with a short poem that starts with a long quote from Alice Paul, who wrote the Equal Rights Amendment in 1920, in 1923, right after she helped women win the vote in the United States. She said, if we get freedom for women, they're going to do a lot of things. I wish they wouldn't. It isn't our business to say what they should do with it. It is our business to see that they get it. What women would do. It didn't matter to Alice. Some women would vote to do away with the vote. Some would choose not to vote. Some would hand their ballot to the men folk. What mattered to Alice was that they could. And that is what matters that women, no matter what they do with the vote, their lives, their bodies can do just that, just that, whatever they want. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Silvia Ramos Cruz um, for 
your ways that that you have carved out that path for so many that would follow you as well as re always reminding us of the women who came before us. I know that that is deeply, deeply in, always important um, to you in the conversations we've had. And I'm so grateful to have you with us today in this celebration of Women's History Month. Well, next we will go north up to uh, the Calgary area. And again, it is always my deepest. There's a phrase that Josephine has in her bio, and I always love saying it. It all like I get giddy, and you can see, like I get giddy thinking about that I'm getting ready to say it. So I'm just gonna say it. <laughs> Josephine Lore, a pearl in this diamond world, has two collections which integrate poetry and photography. Unity and the Calgary Herald bestseller, the Cowichan series. Her work has been read on stage, put to music, danced, integrated into visual art, interpreted through ASL, and globally Zoomed. I guess we have to add that to our bios now, globally Zoomed. Josephine's poetry has been published in literary journals and anthologies in 11 countries, including Freefall Magazine, Tiny Seed Journal in the United States, and Constellate Magazine in England. And of course, please feel free to visit Josephine at her website. And would you please welcome her here to our global Zoom room. Thank you. Uh, I'm absolutely humbled to be in such company today. Um, Sandy, it's a huge honor. I wanna thank you so much, you and Beth, uh, for creating the series and Dawn for all of the help. I feel that through pandemic, through isolation, poetry has been my life jacket and cultivating voices has been a lifeboat. So thank you so much. Um, it's especially meaningful for me to be here on a day when we're honoring the feminine and the poems explore um, what the feminine means to me as a mother, as a daughter, as a sister, as a lover. The first one is called Our Children. A daughter is a dream we dream while still within the womb. We are born with our children inside us. They have been there since we were nothing but a quiet fluttering within the darkness of our mother's bellies. They are there, a memory, a recipe, hidden in the intimacy of our innermost thoughts, waiting for imagination to beckon, for desire to summon, for that moment when the wish to become one with the eternal cycle of creation is wordlessly awakened waiting for the moment when the seed of life is planted deep within, taking root, dividing, subdividing in the silence deep within. I long to hold my children in my arms, to build for them a nest and feather it with love, to sing sweet songs, whisper words of wisdom in their ears. A daughter, is a dream we dream while still within the womb. The second poem I wrote when I was in an airplane flying back to Toronto for my um, mother-in-law's funeral. The tea set. I opened the box. It wasn't for me, it was for the kids. But which kids, Grandma? And would you, could you have known that there would be no room in their lives for bone china? Not 
while they were 10 kilometers deep in forest from the helicopter drop zone, helicoptered in because of fire, planting trees from a low slung belt, a shower, a luxury, no cup of porcelain tea. Not while they are climbing unnamed peaks with a snowboard and avalanche pack on their back, canoeing evening glass lake, life simple and clean, a girlfriend, a black cat. Not while they are gearing down and riding up a mountain on a fat, tired bike, covering their radiant bodies with glitter and tattoos, lipstick blue, feathers and rocks and bones and sticks in their hair. So I serve myself a solitary breakfast on this translucent porcelain, scalloped edge, trim of gold, leaf pattern, dots of opalescent turquoise, like peacock feathers dropped into the city from which the fledglings have fled for the air and the sea and the peaks of BC. You were born in a generation of lacquered nails, careful quaffs. No one saw your tears when your husband's plane went down. Like Jackie Kennedy, widow the week before you, you bore your grief alone. Photos show only a world of black and white. And I, in this foothill land I call home, although the last generation is in Ontario and the next on the coast, I roll my stone to the top of the mountain every day and fall asleep alone. Third poem is called, thank you. The third poem is called The Roof. And uh, I wrote it for my son. You squeezed the metal frame of the screen, slipped out the open window to lay on asphalt shingles and look up at a handful of stars. The din of deer foot traffic incessant. I only found out later. That's how things went when you were kids, the secrets you treasured, the barriers you transgressed, the dreams you dreamt, unbeknownst to me. I should have given birth to you in a forest under bough of ancient cedar. I should have licked from you the vernix, planted your placenta in the cradle of the land. You hear the howl of wolf while you are sleeping, are unafraid of spider, unafraid of snake. You paddle on a silent lake at nightfall. And when you knelt to ask your girl to be your wife, it was in the witness of the snow, the empty fullness of the mountain. You climbed up to the roof to sleep under the stars. You stitched them one by one into the fabric of your life. Um, the next poem I wrote in response to an album that a friend of mine put out, um, this one is called The Highway Traveler. In days of damned and dimming light, she dealt out jacks or better, and though regret seemed heaven sent, like storms and snow and driving rain, dawn came despite the weather. Light and fate and life and love her perfume on your tongue, come midnight when the land was parched, a lazy clock did start the race and bones in prison lung. Her hand stretched out at 2 a.m. to smooth a passing wrinkle. Every dream made newborn flesh and quiet desperation, a warning in eyes twinkle. Her rag doll hair, her ruby lip, unraveled on the ground. In days of wine and crumbling stone, this unknown highway traveler will never more be found. The next piece I wrote for my older sister who married someone from my parents' hometown in Sicily and is living there even though she grew up in Toronto. Uh, my sister Mary, and this is called Mary of the Terrace. 
Mary, you returned to the sun-parched earth of our parents and stand within sight of the cracked escarpments we laughed about as children. You choose to live on the sidelines of town, a town so small that whispered rumors silence you. White oleander grows on your sun-worshipping terrace. With your watering can, you coax red blossom from cactus. And under uncountable stars, your husband's fingers pluck at strings as he sings melodies born 300 years back. Mary, you hang your laundry on a line that faces away from the village. The redolence of oregano and rosemary released as your sun-kissed shin brushes wordlessly past. Um, this next one I, I wrote um, before COVID, I was lucky to be able to fly back to Toronto twice a year at least to visit my mum. And this one is called, I am ready to memorize mother. That new hesitation in her voice as she asks again if she has added salt to the tubatini bubbling in the pots. Every time I fly back and hold her, she has shrunken one size smaller, shed inches of assurance, lost pounds of fierceness. I am afraid to delete her voicemail from my phone, though she always says the same things. How are the kids? Wear a scarf, make some honey lemon for that throat as if I were 12 still, 12 again. And she's surprised at the recipes I recite back to her from memory. The expressions she taught me when I was but a child. Sicilian expressions like on jedo senza tre. Things happen in threes like my sisters and me. When she has grown small enough, I will fold her up and tuck her into my breast pocket so that she can feel forevermore the drumbeat of my heart. And two more. Thank you. This one is called Wild Sky. You are electrons, protons. I am sparking off the sun. You are escaping gravity. I am thrown out of atmosphere by rotation. You are hurtling towards the earth. I am thinner at polar caps. You are colliding with my atmosphere. I am igniting into color and dance. Most of the particles deflected by Earth's atmosphere, but when you kiss me, you become my oxygen. You are lights dancing. I am wild sky. And the last one I would like to read is called Forget Me Not. And I would just like to explain two references. Um, in this poem, I reference Rhiannon and Psyche. Rhiannon comes from the Celtic. Um, uh, tradition. She's the goddess of fertility and rebirth, and Psyche is the Greek goddess of the soul. <clears throat> Forget me not. Forget not the haunting of Reznikov, tower stark against tipped bowl of stars, sidewalk diamond brilliant in winter, untouchable beauty afar. Forget not pre meander in the ivy blue misting of France, la campagne bien avant l'aube, walking the Roman built road. Forget not the drunkenness of delight, l'insouciance, and how right we were then, how right. My waist in the space of your two open hands. I shall sit on the rocks by the water and comb out my long graying hair. You might call me Rhiannon or Psyche, but you would be mistaken, for I am none of those. I am all. With my silent song shall I summon soldiers, sailors to my door and watch them collide unencumbered on the sharp precipice of 
my floor. I shall pick up shells one by one, listen for lost echo of love. I shall open the oyster, drink deep the elixir, savor each pearl on my tongue. Forget me not. I shall ride the camel in cold night across caravan of sand. I shall bathe in moon's blue glow, singe your eyes, burn your hand. I shall pet the memory of each lover, stroke each tender head, watch the flick of tail, push each pad to see emerge and then retract the fatal claw. Forget not the entanglement of sheet and limb, the strike of match, the salt of body and heat. Forget not the clamor of hearts unleashed, burst of amber green and purple black sky yet unseen. Forget me not. I shall pour eel, sorry, I shall, <laughs> I shall pour oil into the canal of your ear as you twist and you turn in tempestuous sleep. I shall crouch and whisper my unspeakable name into the crevice of night. Forget me not, Josephine Luray, thank you so much for having me today. Oh gosh, I could I could just listen to you like for hours and hours. <laughs> oh, so beautiful and just the diff what just so I mean we're to our last feature coming up is our last feature but what I'm so struck by and what I'm so appreciating is you know what I said earlier which was I I knew we would be experiencing you know even just with five people the tremendous range like of voice and experience and um Thank you for your contribution today. Well, our final reader today, um, you've probably heard me say this before, is um, a wonderful, wonderful poet that I have been hanging out with since she was three years old. And it is so gratifying to have witnessed Nadia Naiva's just journey through life, uh, through all the ways that she sees the world and is in the world. Um, and I could, I could, I could talk for a long time about what it's meant to have um, Nadia's presence in my life. But for, but for now, I will read her bio and say how much I'm grateful for the presence of her and her poetry that we now get to experience together. So here's a little more about Nadia. Nadia Naiva is a poet, dreamer, and crop circle enthusiast from Olympia, Washington. She lives and writes in East Hampton, Massachusetts, where she attends Mount Holyoke College via cyberspace. Nadia loves finding typewriters on the side of the road and meeting neighborhood cats. I can attest to for her love of cats. She writes about dream states, childhood, loss, and history. Her essay on David Wojnarowicz from this past summer can be found on the Lambda Literary website. And of course, keep out for what will be the many of her future publications. Hello, Nadia, and welcome on this very special eve that uh, of International Women's Day and some people's birthdays that we know. 
Thank you so much, Sandy. Like, like Sandy said, um, we've been in each other's lives for what, over 15 years now. So that's a pretty beautiful thing. And I, I feel so lucky to be reading in this space I want to give a shout out to my mom who is here, Simona, and who brought Sandy to into my life and brought me into Sandy's life and connected all of us. And it is her birthday tomorrow, International Women's Day. And she has been such an inspiration to me and has shown true care and love and reverence for for women and and for political justice, social justice, all of these things she has instilled in me. And so I want to thank her and to also to also just give more thanks to Sandy because Sandy was a, a an amazing figure in my life and one of the people I always looked forward to seeing when I got to go back to Washington. Um, from from this coast and 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 I still I feel that way still so maybe may we meet again soon I will start by by reading something really small that I just found uh that I typed on a typewriter that my mom actually found on the side of the road this summer <laughs> and this is just a little this is just a small invitation I have so much to say if you'll hear me through my silences. If you promise to laugh along when I laugh or cry when I cry. If you want to stay a bit later and make dinner here before the long drive home, then there are a few things I can promise you. I can promise love without compromise and I can promise conversation. That's, that's the little. That's the little one. This is a poem that I just wrote and I'm calling it something that I need. You know, I like the spiraling emotion of two birds swimming across a glass ceiling and of women in parks throwing balls to mark the summertime emotion. You know that in winter, I find myself missing more than sunlight attuned to buzzes from pipes, bent over the hum of a stereo. More than keeping my head distracted, these actions bring an avalanche of noise from the shallowness of glass that makes inside inside, that makes outside outside. Underneath the sense world, there is form that can only be felt through darkness. You know the grains of dust between my pillows. You know it is always easier living in the ideal city with graceful language, a comfort of airports. I am unlimited as the world. I grow up over and over in the backlit corridor, in the hung space between words. I place a ladder precisely there and send myself over the ledge. I am afraid of the world, and yet I long for it. I will read a po some poems, two poems, that have a lot to do with um, my aunt who died three years ago, and her death was something that shocked me into writing, I would say again after writing a bit in in high school, but it it brought me back to poetry in some way because I felt like I couldn't couldn't get through it or or understand my relation to it without without poems. Okay. One door open to the room overflowing with light. A circus of dust mites in rows on the floor, coating the shadow of the ceiling. Sunlight, the twisting arms that crown the mist above your eyes, above your seven temples. 
The light casts a shadow on the light. I remember all my dreams now, coming and going between my ears like flies. A family of deer sit behind the window, blowing shapes into the glass. Time moves like a feather between them and their bodies stretch out into the dark. I sleep next to the open door underneath the red light, dreaming about underwater animals flashing between forms, heralding the next dimension, splitting the roof in half with sound. I want to try and talk about it in the purple night behind an open door, draw the curtains, pour out the potion, meddle in the fissures while I disappear among them. Shape is very old, title is a riddle. Three doves rest above, above the window, figuring out the light, folding the curves of dust caught between the waves on the surface of her bedroom, chewing on fool's gold. We decide to share because it's our first meal together, but I've forgotten how to eat. I don't know how to describe it. One minute in my car, fogging the windows, painting the air black with quiet emotion. The next thing I know, we're spinning past another winter searching for the end. I wake up thinking about my aunt again and how she died in the room I used to hide inside. She died on the tiles on her knees with dark fluids in her mind and nobody could save her. When I found out I wanted so badly to go back in time and make it possible for her to stay alive because I knew her body was still strong and unburied somewhere. I just had to find it on my own. Chris, I miss you. I leave the windows down for you. I buy pottery for you, but I never see you in my dreams. You turned into a pile of dust that freezes and unfreezes with the day. How can I send back all the time spent tracing your face against mine? I lost all the family photographs after they stopped moving. I could not keep folding them into shapes. I want to kiss you, but I want to kill you first because you're dead and there are waves underneath you. The same way a missing dog is never found. The same way three friends leave the party together but walk home alone. You are here but distant, away and altogether everywhere. The gifts of the body are spent between us. Hold up your wrist to the light. Reach inside your grave and uncover a new face. In my head, I go to the last place I can imagine you walking. I need to know what you were chewing on and why it could never go away. Most of all, I want to understand sim the symbols together before the day rolls by. And this I wrote on the other side of this page. So it must be either a continuation or a predecessor to the last poem. Dreams are a reflection of things kept inside. The other night I dreamt about a spiral the size of the sun giving me the kiss of life. It must be a good omen to have this kind of dream alone and to wake up under the same roof with nobody beside me. With a mouth full of breath and lungs taped over the pieces on the inside. It's very nice to watch the memory play on a loop and drift a while, head in the wind on the back streets, drinking up signs on the side of the I-5. Morning does not begin to cover it. I'm over the side of the mountain coming back to her with light inside the tunnel. She has three years to thank me for since she went away. When I thought she was going to live, I had dreams about her kissing my forehead and always the earth curled up inside her brow, whistling a figure I would probably forget. How much, what's, what's the time looking like? How much time do I have? 
probably read one more or two more. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, I will read one very little poem and one slightly less little poem, <laughs> but not not a big poem. This is a this is a small poem about a, a snail that doesn't exist. Look at the snail. The day you came into the house and busted through the door, we took a handsome photo. You started writing me letters and here we are on the same train. We make so much together. It is almost the only thing that gets better with time. And this is a, the last poem I'll read is called Learning and it, I wrote it maybe a year ago and it brought me into a new world of, of writing and it's a special poem to me. Learning. I parked the wrong car in front of the wrong house next to the wrong tree beside the wrong lake on top of the wrong street underneath the wrong sky. When I stretched my arms and legs they drooped to meet the earth's top layer. I took some aspirin to blanket the pangs. I read a book and when that was over, I went outside. All around earth, I could feel the friends rejoicing, children making faces at each other in the snow. They are taught the meanings of objects through sight and not description. They have no way of knowing that the day we lose our senses the world will still be full of color. Thank you. And thank you, Sandy. Wow, thank you, Nadia. And of course, just because I can, I'm going to say happy birthday to my dear, dear, beloved Simona. Uh, yes. Um, what extraordinary way to celebrate the connection between mothers and daughters on Women's History Month and, and the eve of International Women's Day here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Again, thanks to Nadia, our, our, our last featured reader for today. And to our earlier featured readers, Archna, Sani, Jan Freeman, Sylvia Ramos Cruz, and Josephine Lore. Look for information about how to purchase their books and their projects and their interests, the things that you heard that, that make them tick through time uh, in the chat. And please consider purchasing, if you have the resources, at least one title today to support these amazing poets um, and their presses. Well, now to our live open mic. Uh, we have a great, uh, and so thank you to everyone who signed up for the live open mic. I wanna remind everybody that um, you'll be reading one poem up to three minutes and it's your own or that of a woman or non-binary poet that you admire. And I really love to have, um, you know, so many people would say like, well, how do you do the open mic after you've had all these features? And I don't know, I am a glutton for voices. That's all I can say. Um, and, uh, I, and obviously you all are too for being here. So I'm grateful for those in the audience and grateful for those who will be reading in the open mic. You've seen in the chat um, the order and I'm simply going to introduce you by name. I think Kim and I will help let you know who's coming up next. I'm gonna make a slight change in the order because we happen to have, how special is this? We also happen to have another 
mother and daughter combination reading with us. So I'd love to have them read. So I'm going to swap. I'm going to move um, Scott to read after Asia Oishi. Um, okay. Well, great. Well, first up, we have um, a, a person that I met at Parkland Poets Society um, uh, outside of Edmonton, but resides, I happen to know, in the Cleveland area. Would you please welcome Elizabeth Eisenberg? And you can each, you can just please unmute yourself and read your poem. Welcome. Hi. My poem doesn't have a title. Being a woman, be yourself, but not too much, not too loud or bold or emotional. Keep your tears hidden, except when you should. Be vulnerable on society's terms. The rules are vague and contradictory. Be you, but do it in a way that I can accept. So I twist and turn and try to be everything that you want. Vulnerable yet bold, smart yet naive. I get lost in all that I'm supposed to be. I am a woman, that's it. What a great way for us to start out the live open mic for our Women's History Reading, uh, International Women's Day. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And next, I want to welcome Mary Oishi, whom you, uh, I hope you all saw Mary's reading at our Laureate Love Fest. Mary's joining us from Albuquerque, New Mexico, where she is the current Poet Laureate of Albuquerque. Welcome. Thank you, Sandy. I wasn't sure if I should read this, but she encouraged me to. Women, when we rise. Women, when we rise, we rise heaving, panting, pushing, screaming like Big Bang birthing when we rise. Women, when we rise, we rise against pain, through pain, through pain, through more pain than one body can stand, it seems. Women, when we rise, it's never just one resurrection. It's always bringing more life with it, pulling the whole underworld along. It's bursting tombs into seedlings and springtime and singing tomorrows when we rise. Women, when we rise, truth mountains shadow darken for centuries, burst watermelon and highlit ribs, plain as day for a hundred miles when we rise. Women, when we rise, secrets cry out from crevices, sulfured springs transform to sparkling. What once was poison now is fuel for still more rising when we rise. Women, when we rise, there is no wind can take us down, tethered as we are to moon and mystery. Women, when we rise, all else is trifled, all the foulest deeds of greed and war, all fears that spawn them gone when women find their power. Women, when we rise, we rise together out of bones unnamed and cries forgotten, bonded to ourselves like witch to stake, like slave to chain, like Hiroshima vapor to the stone, like Wada's blood to desert sand. But when we rise, we bring them every soul from the first mother forward, and goddess breath will roar from us forever when we rise. Women, when we rise, we must not, cannot, will not be put down again. When women rise, when women, women rise. Thank you so much, Mary. Oh, when women rise, yes, indeed. Oh, well, I'm so I'm so excited to hear now from Asia Oishi. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Sandy. And thanks to all the amazing featured poets and poets who have read in the open mic so far. It's an honor to be with you all. Uh, this poem is about women, you could say. Of the three fates, I choose scissors. The three fates, one spun, one wove, one cut the thread. I love those sisters, but especially I love the one with the scissors. That's why I collect unusual scissors, funny shapes, miniatures, Japanese style palm held ones, collapsible ones, titanium needle tipped ones. I love my scissors. The finality of cutting, the deliberateness of it, the satisfaction of choosing the what, the when of severance, decision, precision, one thing becoming two, the clean slice, the neat snip, the setting free. I love the fate who holds the scissors. In a Budapest cemetery, I saw a carving of her eyes downcast and head turned to the side at an angle so feminine, so inward looking like a live woman seeing only the still waters of her own grief. Stone flowed over her breast like water and she hung on a cross with the weight of the cut thread in her right hand, the scissors in her left. She was all shades of gray. As children, we learn the specialness of scissors to enclose the blades correctly in our hands when moving them from place to place, to never run with them, to keep them apart from other implements. Our mothers know their simplicity is deceiving. Two inviting circles and twin blades like a mouth, even in this disbelieving age, command respect for their ancient magic. A woman's tool, the size of a woman's hand, needing little force, skill and focus and women's work. The green leaves of my grandmother's embroidery, the seven layered kimono of empresses rich with chrysanthemum, the rugs that keep the shepherd warm on the howling winter steps, the scarves, the shawls, the cloth that swaddles the newborn and covers the newly dead, arise from women's hands wielding the scissors women's minds wielding the knowledge of the clean stroke. Goodbye, Shiva. Sometimes death is not so spectacular as your halls of blood and song. Sometimes it is no blaze of glory or hail of hellfire missile. Sometimes it slips between the details of daily living things and with the smallest motion, it is done. If there is sound, it is only snip. Sometimes it is women's solemn work to determine what continues and what must end. Sometimes the gesture is so delicate, disturbing nothing more than a feather falling from a far flying bird that no one notices the choice has been made. No one that is, but she who holds the scissors. Asia, thank you so much. I um, I love I love that poem, um, and I happen to know that it is from the wonderful collection Rock Paper Scissors, written by Mary Oishi and Asia Oishi, together in the same volume. Um, thank you. I look forward to the next time that the three of us are together with many other voices. Our next poet, and again, I'm so grateful for everybody coming out today. And, you know, um, I wanted to say that one quick thing, Amit is here, Amit Dahiyabacha is here. And Amit and I had a conversation at the end of the reading last week um, where we talked about how it was so important to have the voices of younger, uh, you know, to have generations. It was really important to work to foster that. It's, it's why I'm so excited that we we're able to have featured a poet like, you know, a Nadia who, you know, is, 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 is has been writing for a long time but in how many venues would 
Nadia be able to be a feature. You know, here we want to feature all voices um, through all ages. And um, I just wanted to acknowledge that and thank Amit for having that conversation with me and reminding me of that. And, you know, I want to just particularly thank everybody for coming out, however you um, identify. And um, it's really been important to me um, as a humanist and a feminist um, to, you know, to make, we must be in conversation um, across genders. And so I'm really grateful for, um, the many different folks who have come out today. Our next reader is Scott Norman Rosenthal. Thank you for being with us. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, this is a letter of congratulations to Polly Davies March 2008, for Julia Utz and for Quinn Brisbane. One, we all live in history in a place called the world. My name is Scott. You don't need to dread, not my voice or messages from this part of the world. It's referred somewhere in the Talmud. If you save the life, you saved the world. Two, once upon a time, 11 people got arrested near a house. A judge lived in the house. 200 or so people stood between a man and the death chamber. Most of the people went away. 11 chose to confront. Word from counsel said that we pulled it off. Jim Bevel did it again. New reason for a maverick to be vilified. Talk and hypocrisy. Otherwise, those who didn't confront might be those who ran away. I almost left a worthless life. A muted voice in the jail, in the cold. It wouldn't look bad for what we were doing. Three, once upon a time, I intruded on an evening. You provided information to move beyond corruption into the decades, through the world, for a worthless life, a muted voice. I won't apologize that intrusion. We've learned better than that. I'll congratulate you, Ms. Excuse me. I'll congratulate you, Ms. For saving the world. Uh, Polly uh, po pointed out to me back in the day, she was an activist back in the 70s, that if an adult human male was not a boy, they were a man, well, an adult human female was not a girl, she was a woman. That word girl is coming back with a vengeance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. And I'm so grateful you were able to honor people, women who've mattered to you today, and how we all are in the world together and, and influencing or influencing each other's experiences. Thank you. Well, next we have Kelly Ann. Kelly Ann Parker, I'm so glad to have you joining us today to hear you read. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. This has been a, an amazing such a moving event and I'm so thrilled to meet new poets that are new to me. Um, I write a lot about um, surviving trauma and dissociation. And so um, this poem is about my own experience with a dissociative disorder. 
It's called Instructions to Insulate from Moonlight. Wear malachite, drink hawthorn berries, prepare for the next cycle in the infinite loop. And remember to breathe as the sun starts to fade and paints clouds from below while anxiety grows into a flower named dread. Snapping photos to steal light, which I hide in my pocket to later conjure safety, but land, land eludes me. And I began pacing in a rhythm. This is the dance of my youth. This is the dance of my culture while my feet lift off the ground. And so I float and spin with no handhold in sight, no means to make it stop until I'm swept up in the current. Then the images come first like faded super eight, flash hypersensory, then to sensory fog, the taste of bile and rot. And it slowly slows the nauseating, spinning, rapid flipping, familiar state of dissociation. A familiar task that elude me like opening doors. And so I wait before them until memory returns. And after running from this burning building of a body, avoiding mirrors to evade the reflection of the wild eyed animal eye shine of the familiar and the totem and nothing. Then the nothing, the welcoming, familiar nothing, witty blanket of nothing, and I return, time lost but grateful. I've survived another until the next full moon. Thank you so much, Kellyanne. Thank you for uh, sharing your vulnerability. We were talking about that word earlier today. So I'm so grateful to have had your voice be among the voices today. And um, uh, I look forward to the next time. Thanks for being a member of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. It's a great title too. I'm, I'm horrible at poetry titles, but that was a fabulous title of that poem. <laughs> right, you had me right from the beginning. Well, our next reader um, is Michael Anthony Ingram. And um, Michael is also an incredible ambassador of world poetry. And I'm um, really grateful to have you here with us today on the open mic. Welcome, right. Michael. Thank you very much, Sandy. This poem is a tribute to Carrie Hossell Ward, the first African-American to graduate from Oregon State University in 1913. She reached out and touched history. Although many could not imagine that it was her plan, given that she was young, life still developing, gelling as a creation, still being molded and forged in hues of ebony, bronze, and gold. She reached out and touched history. Although the fathers of the day refused to believe that she could do so, given that she was a woman, the right to vote for the mothers of all fathers still in its infancy, the casings of a woman's world still relegated to the margins of society, despite pleas of social reform from suffragettes and cries of "Ain't I a woman too?" yelled loudly by noble voices who toiled in far distant cotton fields and other distant places of work. She reached out and touched history, although the academicians of the day could not fathom that it was her plan. She was gifted and had the desire and dedication to uplift those and freedom. She reached out and touched history although legions could not foresee that it was her plan, given that she was black, colored black when black was not yet a color, human in one world and not the other, living in a space, time, and place that is not yet conducive to be young, gifted, black, and to be a woman. Nevertheless, she reached out and touched history, and history responded in kind and reached out and met her touch, applauding that she was young, full of hope and promise, reveling she was woman, and half of whole, yet whole, perfect and complete, relishing that she was gifted. In the hollow halls of academe, a college graduate, she set forth to conquer new horizons and find new ways of surviving and thriving in a world she had already achieved despite the odds of achieving, celebrating proudly because she was Black, 
best of her human right to exist, learned to be free, to be cared. She reached out and touched history, and history responded in kind and reached out and met her touch. Destiny smiled and married the ever night human embrace, creating a legacy of opportunities for all of us to achieve goals, reach dreams, and ascend undaunted by the limits of our imagination. Thank you. He reached out and touched history. Really, that could have been, that's, you know, for me, the line that encapsulates this reading today. You know, the many, many women of all colors that have forged that path, had to forge that path to reach out, to reach out and touch history. Thank you so much, Michael, Anthony. Uh, really appreciate coming out today and being a part of the voices here. Our next, I look forward to the next time I see you. Uh, and hear your voice. Our next reader today is Tanya Kohong. It's so great to see you. Oh, you want me to read it? Um, for today, I wanted to be honored, Comfort Women. Recently, there is an article came from Harvard University, International Review Harvard Economic Research, which I'm not sure if it's gonna be published or not published it, but like Mark Lemzier, Harvard professor said, the comfort women called prostitute. That is not acceptable. And I wrote this poem 2015 and it's been my anchor poem. And I'm gonna show you the picture of the, my book, which is supposed to be do book tour, but you know, due to pandemic. Anyway, long story short, and this pregnant woman is a Park Yong Shim. She was pregnant. She was born in 1921. She witnessed, she was the one pregnant woman. So I'm gonna just read you the excerpt of the Comfort Women and let you decide. Nineteen forty-one. That autumn, autumn night, Japanese soldiers withering swords, dragging me away, while I was gathering pine needles. They fell from my basket filling the air with the scent of their white blood. When you scream in your dream, there's no sound. On the maru, grandma's making songpyeon, asking mom, is the water boiling? Will she bring pine needles before me? My eyeballs fall out. I feel pain there. They put a long stick between my legs. Open up. Open, baka chusenji. Their rage spraying, their sperm, the smell of a burning dog, burning life, panting, grunting on top of me. Under my blood, I am dying. 1943, Shanghai, China. One night, a soldier asked all the girls, who can do 100 men? I raised my hand. Sunja did not. The soldiers put her in boiling water, alive and fed us. What is living? Is Sunja living in me? 1946, Jinju, Korea. One year after liberation, I came home, short hair, not wearing hanbok, not speaking clearly. Mother hid me in the back room. At night, she took me to the well and washed me. Scars 
sealed with hot steel, like a burnt bark, like a roots of old trees all over my body. Under the crescent glow, she smiled when she washed me. My baby, your skin is like a white jade, dazzling. She bit her low lip, washing my belly softly, but they had ripped open my womb with a baby inside. Mother made my white rice and seaweed soup, put my favorite white fish on top. But mother, I can't eat flesh. The night in the granary, she hanged herself, left her little bag in my room, my dowry with a rice ball. Father threw at me, waved his hand towards the door. I left at dusk. 30 years, 40 years, forever. Mute, mute, mute. Bury it with me. They call me Wiambu. I had a name. 1991, 3 a.m. The night, the thousand blue stars became white butterflies through ripped rice paper and flew into my room. One, one hundred, one thousand butterflies, endless white butterflies going through the web in my mouth into my unhealed red scars, stitching one by one. Butterflies lift me, heavier than dead. Butterflies opening my bedroom door heavier than shame. At dawn, I stand. 그들은 나를 위안부라고 부른다. 내게도 이름이 있었다. Thank you. Thank you. I see why that's your, I, I know why that's your anchor poem. And I'm really grateful for you coming today to share that on our Women's History Month celebration. And I want to also acknowledge that it was literally a year ago that I met you in the hallway at AWP. And, <laughs> and um, I, I I couldn't, you know, I'm it's such a long time ago, isn't it? Yes. In so many ways. But I'm grateful that the connection endured from that chance meeting in the hallway. Mm. Thank you. And, uh, and I loved all, of course, uh, if you don't know, last April, Tanya did the most extraordinary thing for National Poetry Month. Look Tanya up and see what she created amazing. Um, please put your book in the chat because okay. we, we're talking about it and we'll see you very soon. Right. Yeah. Thank great. You. I'll mention that later. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, we are, you know, here's what I love about Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Every single one of you at any, on, at any particular reading could be, uh, could be a feature here. And, um, and those of you in the open mic today have, have, have stood with your singular poem as like a tremendous voice and feature in this reading. I, I can't imagine the reading without your voices. So I'm so grateful. Our next poet, um, we've had quite a contingent from, um, Albuquerque. Uh, as I like to say, ABQ, ABQ, right? <laughs> from Albuquerque is Holly Wilson. Thank you. And Holly has a fantastic reading series. Also in the Albuquerque area, I wanna give a shout out to Tortuga. Thank you very much, Sandy. I'm so glad to be here. And it's just been wonderful to celebrate <clears throat> um, International Women's Day together. You know, it hadn't got much press for a long time in the US, but I think people are getting more aware of it. And I just really appreciate you contributing to all, all of that, making us more aware how special this day is um, tomorrow, actually. But so 
thank you very much. And I did put uh, my email in the chat. If you want to get on my mailing list for the Tortuga readings, we have a couple coming up soon in March. Um, my poem I'd like to share today is called Stupid Men. This is what you're missing going down on your woman, feeling her muff hair caress your cheeks, feeling her thighs squeeze around her face, feeling her roll and moan as the tip of your tongue wags back and forth across her clit, standing erect in front of you, making her come, you taste her juices flowing out, readying her even more to receive you. This is what you're missing after enjoying your woman from the front, back, sideways, sitting, kneeling, laying down, you can't hold out anymore. And you position yourself to give you, her your best penetration as all of your manhood erupts inside her, your pelvis pushes down on hers, making her erupt too, paralyzed for a suspended moment, clinging as you come together in a hot, lingering embrace. Yes, this is what you're missing. You who have convinced them that it will keep them away from temptation and not disgrace the family honor. It is a rite of passage that all women must go through. Your mothers and aunts had the same thing done when they were your age. Your husband will be much happier to see it more tidy down there. Ten-year-old girl, dress pulled up around her face, underwear pulled off, legs spread apart, screaming, struggling, begging for you not to do it. Her blood curdling cries, muffled by the women holding her down as the piece of broken glass, razor blade, slices off her human dignity as you rape her with your self righteousness. You who give this small piece of flesh so much power that you think it better to remove the source of your discontentment than to take the chance that your woman would spread her legs willingly and gladly give it to you and that you could feel great joy from taking it from her. Yes, this is what you're missing. It is you who have chosen to make yourself impotent of ever truly being able to satisfy your woman or enter into this holy union with her. Stupid men. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Holly, for speaking truth to power. And yes, thank you. And we'll see you next time. And I can't wait to meet you in person. And as I said, ABQ, well represented today. All right, maybe in the future when we can start traveling again. Indeed. Our next reader is Art Good Times. Hi, Art. Thanks Hi, for Vinny. being here today. <laughs> Thank you to Sylvia for inviting me. It's been a wonderful experience. Uh, Dolores LaChapelle was an independent scholar who lived in Silverton, right here in Colorado. Deep ecology. Nothing so window shattering about Dolores LaChapelle's way of the mountain. Chop wood, carry gourds, share the lyric valuables. You bring tea, I'll bring sake. And we'll sing new songs, old chants, and drum until the full moon lets us down deeper than before. Thank you, Art. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Well, my friends, I'm so excited to introduce um, to you all. A lot of you know Siobhan Potter because she and Dora Cipher um, uh, co-host 
uh, what I always say is my favorite reading set, reading series in the world, including not cultivating voices. It's not the time to be silent. Um, and they're coming up on their one year anniversary of, um, of how, as we are, but, but, but they started a little before we did. I'm so grateful to have you join us today uh, for the Women's History Month and International Women's Day celebration. Um, thank you, Siobhan, for really being like a mentor to me. And, I'm, and I also love your poetry. So thanks, and I'm looking forward to hearing your poem. Thanks, thanks, Sandy. That's very kind. Thanks everybody for being here. Um, I inhabit mucus and pus so that when I laugh, I mean it. I inhabit the wretchedness of birth in order to love the parasite until it is self-supporting. I inhabit memory to not forget and to not do it again. I inhabit hate and mistrust so that you can experience it. I inhabit lust and eat from it. I inhabit love for you to have your heart broken and thrive. I inhabit exactitude because knives need to be kept sharp. I inhabit sloth and the mammal in me rests. I inhabit animus, that is the primary relationship. I inhabit light completely so that all that is seen is its darkness depending on your perspective, so move. I inhabit shame when I tire of my right size. I inhabit silence to hear myself. I inhabit God. I inhabit wolf and loneliness. It's as lonely as herdness. I method write, inhabiting a poem till it's had its way, then move on. I move on. I inhabit words until I know what they are saying and can hear what you are not saying. I drink happiness by the neck until drunk, then drink more. I sneak out when it's sleeping. I can come back if I leave. I inhabit shit for you when you won't. I will digest it and give it back in edible form. I inhabit good enough. I inhabit mother. Thank you. Thank you so much, Siobhan. And um, that litany of I inhabit also reminds me of a, a poem that no one has read today, but I've heard um, many times actually in the past couple weeks, which is Audre Lorde's A Litany for Survival, that, um, uh, yeah, the, the litany is so powerful and I really appreciate uh, your voice and your being. Well, we end our reading today um, with Siobhan and another poet joining us from Ireland. Um, and uh, I'm so glad to see you, Anne McDonald. Thank you so much, Sandy. And um, thank you so much to everyone for a fabulous reading. And I'm so pleased to be able to hopefully finish uh, today with a poem of hope. Um, and it's from my new debut collection, Crow's Books, with the blurb on the back by the wonderful Sandy Yanon, your copy winging its way to you, Sandy. It will be launched on the 18th, which is the feast of the goddess Sheila over here. And uh, thanks to COVID and Brexit and lots of stuff, we've had many false starts, but we're finally here. So um, I want to read a poem for you tonight called A Good Wife and a Black Truck. And um, here you go. The spiral was broken when she stopped pretending and started being honest. Is Bill there? He was due on shift at six. Annette, the supervisor's voice, was tentative and low. Maribel answered, no, try the pub. Oh, said Annette. Right, so 
Always a good word, isn't it? And thank you for calling. And sorry if Golden Boy is late for work. And FYI, the baby is not sick. The dog is not in the vets. And all four tires on the car are fully inflated. Annette waited a moment and then said, I see. Well, Annette, it's half past three when he left the house and it takes 15 minutes from here to there. So I wouldn't hold out any hopes of him doing a shift anytime soon. And by the way, you should take note, there's a full moon. The spiral shattered all over the carpet in the hall and something lifted a breeze block off her chest. One down, Artemis, she said to the cocker spaniel, who wiped his tail but looked a bit bewildered. She had the books, feel the fear, change her life. The best life with no strife, an absent wife. But she knew that sometimes you really do have to do things afraid. The long black truck pulled up to the gate to wait until she filled it up with five years worth of a miserable life as a dutiful wife. She left the washing machine but took the large painting of the Japanese peacock and a miniature gold face wind up clock. Black bin bags filled with clothes she later used for rags to clean the windows in her new place. A safe space. And the phone rang just as she closed the door. Artemis carried his own lead to the car. Did Bill get paid today, do you know? I don't know, Joe, to be honest, and I have to go. Annette put the phone down. And as she drove away behind, behind her life in the black truck, driven by Pat the man, half truck, half van, who could and would shift anything, she had the sneakiest suspicion that Golden Boy would never see it coming and would be genuinely left in shock, up to his narcissistic balls in hock. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. And would you please You're put in the chat? I will. Yeah. Your book. Thank you, Anne. Anne Thank read you. in our in our new book showcase this fall from the collection, but as has often has has happened to um, folks, um, presses because of the pandemic, uh, you know, give a release date and it gets and the pre and the printing gets delayed and. Um, so I'm so glad now that as that your book is seeing the light of day um, yeah. and that it's worked out well for you and your publisher. Um, thank you. And folks, I want to thank all of our poets reading today um, in the open mic celebrating women's history as well as our features with really a reminder that you know we should never limit the understanding of a history of a silenced group or any group or any peoples to just one month, right? The more we embrace all our histories daily in connection and in context, the more we embrace all humanity because as um, poet uh, Audre Lorde says, and always reminds us in her amazing book of essays, um, Sister Outsider, your silence will not protect you. And our reading today, I think, was tremendous evidence of how when we speak out against and to and with and for um, and, 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 in, in all that, and in all the permutations to history, um, we are the strong. We are the stronger, um, as as individuals, and hopefully together. So thanks to all our poets in the open mic. I want to thank um, Elizabeth. We started out with Elizabeth Eisenberg, Mary Oishi, Asia Oishi, Scott Norman Rosenthal, Kellyanne Parker, Michael Anthony Ingram, Tanya Kohong. Holly Wilson, Art Good Times, Siobhan Potter, and we ended the open mic with Anne McDonald. And thank you so much to our featured poets that started us out a couple hours ago. We began our reading today earlier with 
to the beautiful, amazing voices of Arch Nasani, Jan Freeman, Sylvia Ramos Cruz, Josephine Lore, and Nadia Naiva. I want to remind you all that none of this would be possible, of course, without Don Krieger. And thank you to the vision of my sister Elizabeth Ann. And thank you to Kim Ports Parsons for being the chat goddess today. And a reminder to join us next week on Sunday, April, Sunday, April, sorry. March 14th <laughs> for our new book showcase. We'll be featuring Lucy Adkins, Ellen Stone, Michael Durack over from Limerick and Sandra Winters. And in two weeks on March 21st, it's our celebration of Women World of World Poetry Day. Tanya Kohong will be one of the features. Thanks, that's it for today. Tonight, friends, I know some of you, it's, it's evening. I hope to see you around Zoom, and maybe perhaps as soon as tomorrow, if you have a hankering to travel to Cork, Ireland. I happen to be the feature with Lawrence McEwen at, um, and other poets on the open mic at the very famed Ovale, curated by Paul Casey. Until then, or soon. From my seaside nook in Old Saver, Connecticut. Ahoy, my friends. Safe travels. Be safe and keep writing.